Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to our AbilityNet webinar, HR Update, Workstation Ergonomics for a Safer, More Effective Workplace. This session has been delivered uh, through the GoToWebinar, uh, but you can also find the slides at slideshare.net slash AbilityNet. So you can follow what we're doing on the slideshow as well as following it on the screen or instead of, depending on which one's simpler for you. Um, we're going to be talking through this, uh, talking to you. Um, uh, three people are going to be on the call. And um, so I just want to check first that you can actually hear me. So you'll see that you should have a control panel that says um, questions. That you can ask questions or you have a chat box. If you could use either of those, the questions box or the chat box. Could you tell me whether you can, can hear me? just so that I know that I'm not talking to uh, the outside world. Um, if you can hear me, could you just type something into the answer box? Great. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Lorna. Um, thank you, Michael. And if you are having problems, then let me know there as well and just say if there's something that you can't see or something you can't do uh, that you not, might need particular help with, just so that I know. Um, I know there's a couple of people who said when the accessibility requirements that they may need some um, additional uh input great i can see everybody saying great loud and clear thank you great so um there's going to be uh, about 30 minutes of presentation um uh, lots of chances for questions you'll feel free to ask questions as we go along there are three people who are going to be joining us i'm, I'm just going to introduce them sarah can you hear me yes i can yes great um could you introduce yourself and say what you do at AbilityNet? I'm Sarah Irving. I'm a senior assessor at AbilityNet and I have a degree in ergonomics. I've been assessing workstations and workplaces since 1997 and I currently work on a number of contracts for large organisations, one-off assessments for individuals and small companies and I also undertake access to work assessments. Great, thank you. And uh, Robin, you're here as well. Have you like to say hello? Hello everybody. <coughs> My name is Robin Christofferson. Uh, Uh, which is helping to raise awareness about the incredible empowering potential of technology and simple reasonable adjustments as well. Uh, a lot of you know public speaking, advocacy, that sort of thing, uh, and doing webinars too. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Walker. I'm the marketing manager for AbilityNet, and I run um, sort of marketing and communications programs across our charitable and our commercial activities. What we're going to be doing today is um, sorry, uh, is uh, looking at workstation ergonomics. Uh, there are five areas that are here in terms of the particular topics we're going to cover, um, but we're also going to be taking questions as we go along. So um, if you do have anything that you think of that you want to know, um, you can um, use it, uh, uh, ask questions. Sorry, I've got somebody saying they can't hear anything. Aaron, are you still, are you able to hear anything? This, uh, have we started? You need to turn up the screen. I need to respond to that sorry great so we're going to be looking at what it what is ergonomics understanding what ergonomics is um, then looking at the impact on employees and um, how that gets played out in the workplace some information about legal responsibilities so that employers understand what they need to be um, providing for their employees. And then Sarah is going to use her um, experience to tell us a bit about the common issues that she sees and uh, how they're dealt with on a day to day basis. A little bit of information about AbilityNet. Um, we provide a range of services to disabled people in supporting, in, in supporting them to use technology at work, at home, and in education. So just some examples here. We provide support, as Sarah said, we provide support into the workplace with large employers on a, on a large scale, um, BT, Lloyds Bank, uh, and others. We also provide um, student services uh, for those students that are eligible for disabled students allowance. We provide an assessment. That's the sort of one-to-one -one review of what your needs are uh, and how and what technologies or other adaptations will be relevant. We have a digital accessibility service which looks at websites and apps and makes those accessible. We did the Olympics website. We tested the 
the Paralympics and Olympics websites, which even though that was a long time ago, we still, we're still very proud of. Um, and we then, on top of that, we provide free IT support to disabled people, including a helpline and fact sheets. We've got a very um, innovative, interactive tool called My Computer My Way, which shows you all the different adjustments you can make on your own computer, your laptop, or your smartphone. And then we also run something called the Tech for Good Awards, which we run with BT, which celebrates how people use technology for um, make the world to make the world a better place. So a very broad range of technology, disability, social good. Today's session is all about um, adjustments you can make to the workstation. And the first point is the, um, the one size doesn't fit all. That a lot of what we're going to talk through today will be top tips and ideas and um, adjustments that you can make to a workstation. But um, this isn't something you can easily just pick up and say, well, because you've got this particular problem, then this will be the particular solution. Everybody's needs are different. And, um, and Sarah will come on to in a little while that there isn't an average person. Um, that, that everybody's got different sizes and shapes and, and needs. But if you think of it this way around, that in an average office, um, just um, around you now, there may be 10% of people will be left-handed. 15% um, wouldn't be able to read a 10-point font without straining their eyes, relating to their eyesight, whether that's age-related or any other particular reason. Um, and there's 10% or maybe more will have dyslexia or some related um uh, need relating to uh, dyslexia so you can see that those sorts of numbers of people around you indicate just how different people's needs are then um, I've got some examples here uh, we've all seen um, workstations and workplaces that are a little bit messy and don't necessarily follow the rules um, this is an, some examples of the, the ugly here's some boxes underneath the table meaning that you can't put your legs under properly um, and just storing things around the office often those get put in the wrong place and we all know the effects of that uh, a messy workstation this is the we've gone from the ugly to the uglier uh, just a, com a complete mess and um, too much stuff on the desk nowhere to store it properly uh, and that's going to cause problems um, or the downright ugly the ugliest of all this is um, somebody's workstation they've set up in their bedroom on a tabletop that doesn't look strong enough to support the screens that are there which are much too close together and all, and all other glaring errors you can see there so these are these are the sorts of things that we see around us every day um, what I'm what I'm interested in is I'm going to run a poll and I'm, I'm just going to set that up and run it and I'm going to ask you what your interest is um, a, a pop-up will come up um, please tell us whether you um, are attending because you're interested in for yourself or whether it's part of your work or what other reasons you have for, for being here today okay so I've got um, I can see when most of you have voted so I can see that I think nearly everybody has voted now I'll just reveal the results to you um, so mo for most people, it's part of your work. Um, for those of you that said other reasons, if you could just mention in the questions box what, what um, the reasons are, that would be interesting. Anything you can, any, any extras that are different to whether it's for yourself or for your work and what reasons you're here today. Great, thank you. People are just saying that it's part of their, um, that, that they have a family member. That, they're, that may be interested. Okay, I'll hide the results and we'll carry on. So, uh, Sarah, you're an ergonomist. Can you tell us what ergonomics is and uh, how it relates to the work that you do? Yeah, it's basically the science of work and the science of the people who do it, the ways it's done, the tools and equipment they use, the places they work in, and the psychosocial aspect of the working situations. It's the science of fitting the job to the worker, so not making the worker fit to the job or the environment or the workstation in this case, but actually adapting things to the worker. And the purpose of it is, and indeed workplace workstation assessments purpose, is to maximise performance and minimise the risk of illness and injury. Great, thank you. 
And, and obviously, you, you're going to mention that the, there isn't really an average person. So this is a big part of why why your work is so important, I guess. Yeah, basically, as you say, there. Uh, one branch of ergonomics is anthropometry, and this is another science, science which deals with body measurements, particularly with measurement of body sizes, shapes, strengths, and working capacities. And it shows us if you there's no such thing as an average person. You've got two people here, one is short, one is tall, but the person who's short has a wide range of reach and the person who's tall can't reach as far. So that just shows, you know. And also, because two people are of the same height, it doesn't mean they have the same same strength or arm reach capacity, or indeed need the same make or model of chair. And it shows us that all equipment should really have adjustability built into it. Brilliant. Thank you. So, um, Robin, um, we know that it, employers in the workplace have, have certain responsibilities. Can you tell us a little bit about that in terms of what the law says? Certainly, yeah. So um, there's several bits of legislation that are applicable here. There's there's a whole raft of employment law that would be to this here, but it can be basically summed up to say that there is a duty of care that all employers have for their employees, permanent, temporary, even contracted, if you're providing the workplace for them to work in. And then with a known condition, an impairment or a disability of some kind. So that's additional and that requires that reasonable adjustments over and above a safe ergonomic workstation um, that we'll be looking at soon is also put into place these reasonable adjustments that help overcome their particular impairment to mean that they can work safely too and I'm sure Sarah is going to be mentioning about some instances where the standard ergonomic workstation <clears throat> is impacted somewhat by someone who needs to use a special bit of equipment or, or um, particular methodology of, of accessing their technology. And then health and safety regulations, um, there's a lot of particularly around display screen equipment, I'm sure anyone that's in the workplace has done a make sure that they're um, working safely and what we're going to be looking at here is is broadly based on that but with the impairment uh, aspects built in too it's surprising though how many have done a DSE assessment at some point and yet if you uh, you know walked up behind them today and had a look at their workstation um, you know, it would still show, show some of those ugly or even uglier characteristics that we saw earlier. Okay, thank you. I'm aware there might be some sound issues. If you if you are having trouble with the sound, um, uh, please let me know if you miss anything important and we can repeat it. So um, in terms of the workplace, Robin, uh, leaving aside the legal issues, what are the impacts that people have as an employer or as an employee? So around nine UK today use a computer of some kind and many of those are at a workstation by no means all though some people will be using technologies um, out and about on the shop floor working from home working from a car um, and increasingly people who are working from desks, their own dedicated workstations, so there are some very particular challenges around hot desking and that can be a very um, can big factor, contributory factor to um, the sort of difficulties that Sarah will talk about in a moment. So some of the, the sort of key things that we see, um, you know, chronic absenteeism, you know, way above the, the standard level, chronic sickness, and that can, obviously that implies long term as well, even um, as far as, as medical retirement is concerned, and that's not cheap by any means, I think on average about £200,000 um, per medical retirement. And then you've got claims, you know, com um, aren't uncommon as well, and uh, are often related to issues arising from poor ergonomics and medical conditions that, or, or stress or anxiety that have um, been significantly contributed to by a poor workstation or poor working environment. Great, thank you. 
And Sarah, just translating that from the concern from the employer's point of view, what sort of things do you see in the workplace in terms of the most common issues? We see a lot of things that are common. In fact, whatever the disability, most people are doing the wrong things or the workstation is set up incorrectly in the same way. Um, some common issues we come across is poorly adjusted chairs or in fact unsuitable chairs. Obviously in an office everyone tends to have the same chair to start with and most people don't um, know how to adjust their chairs and we come across quite a lot of people that don't even know their chairs adjust and they're quite amazed when all we do is raise the backrest and it helps them greatly. Monitors and keyboards positioned badly, we'll see a picture Most people actually move the mouse incorrectly, which can give rise to bad wrists and wrist problems. But these issues can actually point to a bigger problem within an organisation. And we can see that, you know, if people don't know their chairs can be adjusted, that may be because in house. Um, sometimes a lack of understanding within HR and management teams and quite often it's dealt with as a health and safety issue and not as an ergonomic one or a working issue and often there's misunderstanding and lack of knowledge of legal risks especially amongst employees and managers. Great, thank you. So we've got uh, a picture here um, Sarah of a very poor workstation can you just lead us around the sorts of problems that this that this image shows um, in terms of the standard setup? Yeah, okay, we'll talk about a few of these. Um, we can see that there are problems with the chair there and the posture of the person. And that means the back isn't supported adequately and that can obviously lead to back aches and pains. The feet aren't um, flat on the floor and this can mean that pressure can build up under the thighs. This can cause swelling and pins and needles in the feet and the legs. If you're sitting at the incorrect height, which most people will see, um, or if the keyboard's at an angle, the upper body won't be in a neutral position. The upper body position is the most important thing, really, um, when we're assessing. As I say, most people sit too low, which means the shoulders are hunching upwards, which can cause problems with the neck, the back, the shoulders, the arms, and um, you know, and also the, the, the wrists and hands. And a lot of people reach to the keyboard, particularly in call centres. They have their scripts and their notepads in front of the keyboard, between themselves and the keyboard, and it means they're reaching to the keyboard. Uh, people are nearly always reaching to the mouse. And obviously this means you're not in a neutral position and can lead to aches and pains in the back shop. Likewise, a lot of people place the screen in the corner of the desk and this means the person's twisting to view it and it, it gives uneven pressure um, on the neck muscles. And that can be exacerbated by the screen being too high or too low as well. Really, um, you know, you shouldn't be looking up or down. Uh, in between the user and the keyboard or they're to one side of the keyboard which again can push if they're on the same side of the mouse they can push the um, mouse further away or it means they're constantly twisting to their documents. Great thank okay. you and uh, I'm sure we all recognize some of those from, our, from, from most workplaces would have some of those issues so what sorts of problems are these going to bring up for people? Sarah? Yeah, I mean, the majority of people we see, I mean, obviously we do see people with more specific disabilities and problems, um, but most people we see, they are physical musculoskeletal symptoms and normally um, some kind of discomfort, aches, these can be intermittent or constant tightness. And the most common places we see the symptoms in are the neck, the shoulders, the back is probably the most common and it's normally the lower back. Um, very occasionally the mid, quite often the upper, but mostly the lower. The arms, the elbows, the wrists and the hands. And um, when we see people with leg and knee problems, they've got a pre predisposing condition already. It's not usually caused by the workstation. Um, but the most recent HSE statistics on musculoskeletal disorders show that there was a 20% increase in 2013 and 2014 and 80% of the new work related illnesses were attributable to work conditions so it's quite a big problem. Okay and uh, just, just to repeat that so you're saying that there's a growing amount of 
physical problems in the workplace? Yeah, yeah, musculoskeletal disorders. Yeah, there was a 20% increase in the last, well, in the last set of statistics, 2013, 2014. So, you know, um, people more. So, um, you know, there are going to be more problems, really. Yeah. And um, the causes. You've mentioned some of these, really, in the sense of that bad workplace. But just to reiterate, the causes. Yeah, of the, the, the things that cause. Be straight on in front of you, you should not twist, you should not reach. Um, incorrectly adjusted furniture and equipment, which leads to the awkward and twisted postures. Um, the layout of the workstation, um, you may have heard of um, comfort zones and reach zones on the workstation. I think there's some advice on our fact sheet about that, about putting things you use most often nearest to you. Excessive stretches and reaches that relates to that as well. Static postures is a big, big problem, which is why we can see a lot of people based at um, workstations because they're sitting in one posture all day. And stress and muscular tension. All of these can be addressed by good practice. Right, thank you. And uh... That's not. I mean, it's not just physical problems, is it? I mean, you've, you've talked you've talked about physical problems. I think because this is the majority of what you see, but of course there are other issues that come up as well. Yeah, I mean, we see obviously a multitude of issues, and they're not all uh, all physical. Um, you know, poor workstation ergonomics can also cause problems for users' vision, for example, strain, fatigue, or headaches. Um, and poor workstation ergonomics can also lead to stress. If somebody's already got a stress-related disorder, poor workstation ergonomics can exacerbate that. Or if a person already has a problem with a vision or hearing or a specific learning difficulty, we see a lot of people with dyslexia, adjustments may be needed to the workstation or environment to, to, to help them with that as well. Great, thank you. So let's go back to the workstation. Can you just lead us through a bit more about the, the good, this is the good workstation. Yeah. Tell us I mean, more I'm, about what's going right here. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a perfect picture, but it's it's a good example of a workstation. Um, I have a more neutral back posture. So the chair's been adjusted correctly. Um, the backrest has been put up, the seat pan has been lengthened a slight bit. And you can see that the shoulders, I mean, his shoulders actually don't look that relaxed, but they, they are more relaxed than in the other photo. And as I said, the shoulders being hunched up, so that's very, very important. The arms and the wrists are parallel to the floor, or, or preferably tilting down slightly the lower arms, which is a little bit better because it opens up your upper body posture slightly. Uh, footrest is being used in this picture, so there's less pressure being exerted on the thighs. This is also connected with seat pan length, and really, um, chairs should have adjustability in seat pan length. It's difficult not to sit up straight when you're using a footrest. Um, I don't ad actually advocate what's in this picture. I advocate pushing the footrest a little bit further back. Um, when your legs are almost straight, it's very difficult. And, you know, imagine you're using footrest and stick your legs out. It actually makes you sit up straighter and use the back of the chair. So that's a really good tip. And we, we very often recommend footrest for people, not just because they can't reach the floor, but because they have a bad posture and it encourages them to sit in a good posture. The screen's been raised in this position and it's now um, put um, directly in front of the user. It's an upper body posture. And the document, you probably can't see it here, it's a very small, a small document holder has been placed between the screen and the keyboard. And this brings the documents closer to the eye line. This isn't a very good example of one, but there are a range of really good document holders out there which raise the documents so they're closer to your eye line. So you're not bending down much, which is particularly good for tall people. And it's also directly in front of the user and it eliminates the need to twist to look at the documents. It's also good to recommend these for people that tend to push the keyboard back and reach the keyboard because once that document holder's there, they can't then push the keyboard back. So that, that's a good... Examples of workstation assessments I've done recently, I mean, we, we always have this sort of the bog standard ones, um, normally lower back problems, and it's basically just trying to get the person into a good posture. Um, so um, a screen raiser to raise the screen, a footrest, the document holder, 
and we check and adjust the chair um, if it's not suitable for this chair. My experience, most standard office chairs, the lumbar support doesn't go high enough and over the years, I've been doing this for quite a number of years, I've realised that the, the um, lumbar support should go a little bit higher than what people actually think it should do um, to hold people with a back in the right s -cut. Um, we sometimes get more complex ones, but we're just looking at physical ones here. Um, a lot of people, um, if they've got bad backs, they prefer to alternate between sitting and standing. If they do this, it's not a good idea to be sort of resting on a, a, a filing cabinet or a windowsill or bending down to the desk. Um, you, you'll all have um, adjust or you can get things that sit on the desk that just raise the keyboard, the mouse and the screen. Um, I saw somebody recently who needed one of these. He didn't have a back problem, he had a shoulder problem, but it was very important for him to vary his sort of shoulder and his arm heights um, slightly. So we recommended a height adjustable workstation, but ended a sit stand stool as well, so he could take a bit of the weight off. And an input, a different input device. Um, we got him a bar mouse so his arms could be more neutral, so his shoulder wasn't going off centre. And he travelled to a lot of other sites as well, so um, we got him a very lightweight laptop razor. So when he's using his laptop, he could take that with him and a separate mouse and keyboard. Great, thank you. Um, uh, costs and um, and the price of this stuff. Do you, do you, how ma how many of the things we just talked through there would actually be particularly expensive? Or are there things there that um, you know that anybody would have to hand just need to be set up? Yeah, quite expensive, um, but they're 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 not that expensive. I wouldn't like to give a figure out now. Um, we I particularly like a particular range of chairs and um, it's not that bad price wise but I recommend it because it has a big range of adjustability and also a big problem with adjusting chairs is if people's not, if, if someone's not in the office I recommend has um, numbers on all the adjustments so you can actually sort of um, log down your numbers. Things like the, the document holders, it depends how complex they are. Um, you can get ones that are right in slopes as well, but if you've got get a box standard one, they're pretty cheap. Footrests, very cheap. Screen raisers, very cheap. And at the end of the day, you know, if you can't afford a screen raiser, you can raise it up. We quite often recommend um, for smaller companies reams of photocopy of paper because they're actually quite sturdy and they're not unstable, so they're a good thing to raise them up on. Um, so no, um, you know, and just moving things around doesn't cost anything. No. Okay, thank you. Um, and you've mentioned a couple of examples here. I guess the point we're making as well is that, you know, that ranges from getting your posture right, which, as you say, could just be about sitting properly in the chair through to specialist equipment. Um, yeah. And you, we, we were talking about perching stool. Somebody's um, asked a question about standing up. Um, whether we what we you know what our view is of people working standing up which you see more information about these days than did before yeah i mean it's it's very um it's very trendy at the moment to to work standing up but it is actually very good for you but i wouldn't recommend it permanently um it's very good to alternate between sitting and standing it's not good to be in a sedentary position all day and to be static and that's where the problems arise um you know the back and the body isn't designed to sit and it's not designed to, to stay still. So the more movement we can get in, the better. Um, we, we do quite a lot of sit-stand workstations. Um, it is good practice, um, but if people can't afford these or, or don't really want to be standing up in a, in a large office because they feel you know, like everyone's looking at them and they're, you know, they just feel a bit odd standing up. So what we also recommend for everyone is micro breaks. And that means you're, you're basically fidgeting. So if you're a fidgety person, you won't have a problem with this. But we do come across people that will sit there for three to four hours, you know. And it's very important for every 20 to 30 minutes. It's not a break. It's just stand up and sit down. And obviously, this is really good for the eyes as well. Change the focal length of the eyes and you get less eye fatigue as well. OK, great. Thank you. Um, somebody asked, what is the range of chairs that you recommend? What is that? What, the one you said you like, what is that one? 
can we say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we... I don't see why not, yeah. Yeah, it's um, the Active Ergonomics Flow Chair, FLO. Um, a lot of suppliers do this chair. It's very, very good. I mean, as I said, I've been doing this for a number of years and I find it, um, you know, it's not just for tall people. They do a mid back, a low back and, and a high back. I, nine times out of 10, do the mid back. That suits most people. I've got people that are seven foot and four foot sitting on the mid back one. Um, but the, the lumbar support does go up to 30, 34 centimeters, I believe, from the seat pan. And a lot of your average chair doesn't go up to that. Some of them even go up to, only go up to 24. Um, also, as I say, the, the numbers on them um, so people can write down what the settings are, which is really, really good. And they're good for people to share in that way as well. And also, it's a cost saving because if someone leaves, there's a big range of adjustability and it can be adjusted to someone else as well. OK, great. Thank you. Um, just to be clear, just to make it clear, um, we don't actually supply the equipment. So we we are independent of any suppliers. And so Sarah's views, you know, really reflect a professional opinion. We We don't. We don't supply the equipment. We supply information about what you what you should get or what's required, and then we have some suppliers that we work with directly um, that we pass on to. Um, let's just uh, very briefly finish with this. Um, obviously, what's happening in in the workplace is that people are starting to move around a lot more than they used to. Um, we've got a picture here of somebody in a car having a meeting um, with a laptop. Um, what do you see uh, in terms of the work that you do, Sarah, that that's, that how is this impacting people's lives? People that don't actually have a workstation. Um, we we even assess engineers for some companies. So they're out and about, they're in their vans, their cars with their laptops. Um, we see a lot of people that travel from site to site, um, people that, that are staying in hotels a lot of the time. Um, you know, so they're, they're working from different places all of the time. They're using other mobile devices as well. We have to do um, vehicle assessments and things like that. And, you know, not everyone has a fixed work st workstation. As I think Robin mentioned before, um, people are being expected to hot desk more. And we have in our reports when we assess people is to have their own workstation. Quite often when we go into an office where it's all hot desk in, we're, we're having to recommend that they have their own workstation so it's set up for them and they don't have to move their equipment around. I did some work in a, a call centre once and they weren't allowed to have their own workstation. So when the people weren't on shift, if they had a specialist chair, they had to stack the rest of their equipment on top of the chair and then move it with their bad backs, I must say, you know, to, to a storage room and then move it back when they came back on shift. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, so it's not conducive to healthy work. And as long as there's adjustability in a hot desk, then it's not so bad. People can set them up. But the people don't tend to, to set them up when they come in in the morning. That is the problem. Um, so they can be almost anywhere. It's not just desk base. Um, and, and not just computer users. And I think we've um, got another picture here that shows one of our assessors, Phil. If we can bring that up, Mark. Um, and he was asked to assess working up a pole because this is the where the person's workstation was, basically where the workplace was. So, you know, it's not all desk assessments we do. We, we actually assess people in shops. Um, trying to think where else we assess them, but but all over the place we do teachers and we've done policemen, firemen, um, dustbin. I've done a dustbin man. We've done nurses. Um, you know, so it's not. A, you must stress that it's not just your workers that work at a desk. It's your workers that are out and about and working in other parts of the building and other places. Great, thank you, um, Robin. I've got a question here, uh, which um, links to the to the legal position. Um, what is the employer's liability if the worker is remote, works from, a, for example, if they work from home and then they have a poorly set up workstation or perhaps they work from an armchair? How, how does the employer as liability work then? My understanding is that the employer is still liable if they've allowed them to work from home. If they're contracted. We do get a lot of people that, we see a lot of people that say, well, actually, I work from home a couple of days a week. Um, then we have to ascertain whether they're contracted to work from home. 
because if it's their choice, then then they're not usually liable. But if they are contracted, um, then we, we do do a lot of home assessments as well. And quite often we have to get people two sets of equipment so they can have them in the office and at home. Mm -hmm. But it is very, very important. And it's probably more important than in the office to get them assessed because the picture Mark showed you earlier where the, the, with the workstation by the bed, we see some horrendous situations with home working. Okay. And so the, just to clarify, the, the contractual position will, will clarify whether or not there's a specific liability, but, but, but presumably they would have some sort of a responsibility if somebody's working at home regularly anyway, to just, just yeah. look after them, not from the point of view of the legal stuff, but just simply in terms of well-being, it will be useful for them to have to be considering that. Yeah. Great, thank you. So just to wrap up. Arrangement, um, the duty of care under you know, employment law has been used to full effect in uh, compromise agreements. Okay, so that, that that's the duty of care within the um, employment law which says that you, you must take care of somebody irrespective of where they're working for you, presumably. Absolutely, if they're working for you during those hours. Sarah's right, if it's in the contract then it's absolutely watertight. Um, it is their place of work, if, albeit part-time. Um, but even in an informal situation, it's often the case that that has been, you know, that, that the assumption has been that the employer is still responsible for them if they are delivering work during that time for the employer. Okay, great, thank you. So just to sum up uh, the overall message, um, in terms of what you're trying to do in the workplace, and um, particularly in terms of adjustments to the workstation, the goal is for every employee to be safe, comfortable and productive. Um, Employers must offer reasonable adjustments. There are legal requirements. The reasonable adjustment is making adjustments that are reasonable. Uh, what is reasonable? Well, it sort of depends on the situation. And what that leads on to is you know, one size doesn't fit all. This isn't a, a simple situation where because this person's got this particular need or this particular physical symptom that this particular solution will solve that. Um, it's definitely looking at the individual and looking at um, that it's not about fitting the person into the environment, it's about fitting the environment to meet the person's needs. So um, if you do have any questions, um, please let us know. We're just going to, one link here that I will mention um, is the University of East London has an interactive uh, display screen health and safety questionnaire. You can click through that. I've got the, got the address on the slide here. The slides are available on SlideShare. This note will also be sent round afterwards. Um, for further information but there's an interactive guide there we also have a fact sheet which is just being updated and will be available on our website we'll send that round when that comes up which has got a lot of the information we've talked about today plus some other useful information for, for employers uh, and employees um, uh, so please if you've uh, got any questions I, we've had a few coming in um, uh, that uh, you've got um, any information that you need more um, somebody said Robin's answer faded uh, about working from home so we may just repeat that um, and uh, another question about home working so Robin perhaps if you could just repeat the, the stuff about your your answer about the working from home and the um, duty of mm. care many apologies yeah I mean I'm aware that, that I keep on going in and out because that's what I can hear you know temporarily happening with you guys so apologies um, the if it's contracted that you can work from home for certain hours or part of the week, then it's undeniably um, covered and the requirement, the responsibility is on the part of the employer to make sure that your working environment at home is safe too. Um, but we have, we, you know, we have a lot management and yet the duty of care has been um, successfully uh, shown to be on the part in the part of the, the employer still uh, when it comes to uh, compromise agreements. So I think that um, if your employer says to you that they're not responsible at all for what you do at home, but uh, if you're delivering work for within you know your normal working hours for for work, um, then chances are that you. Uh, should be um, a bit more forceful in saying that you know actually we think that I think that you're responsible and I don't feel like I've got enough equipment at home or whatever it might be. Okay great thank you. Um, one, one other question that I have uh, in terms of your work that you do um, 
Sarah. Uh, how long does an assessment take? How long do you actually have to work with somebody to sort of understand what their needs are? It, it depends, really. I mean, we, we book two-hour slots. Um, we do run over sometimes. Very, very rarely, you know, it's... Quite often the standard ones probably if it's an easy one about an hour long so it's, it's not too bad okay not too long. and the way that we work just to be clear is that people would book us to come in and see somebody and then we would just choose the best time for the for the for the employee um so this is it's a sort of a, a standard setup and it's a service that somebody can book in and choose when when we come in and that you know we'll get some information beforehand so we'll know what we're doing and I think that's the point is that as much preparation as you can do as possible will help you find the right answers okay well um, I'm aware we had some technical difficulties there I think that we've all been fading in and out so I hope that hasn't uh, caused too big a problem for you I'm just going to put up a final poll asking you how useful you found the webinar um, but uh, also just to let you know that we have other webinars um, we have one coming up about um, RSI in uh, a month's time and uh, that's another one relating to our workplace uh, information we also have one in a couple of weeks time looking at how Barclays have built an accessible app they've made their banking app accessible and we're looking in detail at how they did that and what the changes were to the to the previous version of their software so thank you very much for joining us um, uh, the, this a video the recording of the, the uh, webinar will be available afterwards and we'll try and sort out the sound as part of that um, and we'll send some notes around with any other, further information that may prove useful just show the show you the poll um, so you can just see that 42 percent of people found that very useful so that's obviously been a good session today so thank you very much for joining us um, and if you want to be involved in the next session I've put the wrong date on here. I've just noticed I've put today's date. The next session is actually on the 11th of March for the RSI in the workplace. But I'll uh, adjust that and send that information around afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Sarah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.